so you start I think so so uh, yeah after lunch not so easy um, well hello again here at uh, the second part of uh, this day uh, my name is Werner Lutsch I'm Chief Executive Officer of uh, AGFW, which is the German District As uh, Energy Association, but I'm also President of European Power. And uh, I'm happy having you here for this uh, session about regulation and practice, issues, solutions, opportunities. And uh, what we have here is, uh, well, what are the regulation challenges in the field of district heating and cooling, of course. What is the state of the art in energy policy? Um, what, not only here, but also at home. What are the underlying principles of good practices? And uh, well, we have a series of experts and panelists, and we will first of all have two presentations, and then we will talk a little bit more about experience and uh, what we know and what we can do in uh, district heating and district cooling. And we will start with district cooling. And therefore, we have here as a first presenter, uh, Ibrahim Mohamed Al Sada, uh, who's uh, responsible at uh, Karama um, for district cooling. We just had a short discussion up front and uh, as a, an engineer he has a lot of experience in uh, district cooling and uh, his presentation will bring you something or a little bit more about what happened here and uh, what uh, we can learn fro from you from uh, water networks planning and uh, cold planning and so on. So, Mr. Alzada, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is awake. Sorry to start too late, but it was no option. I think I have something interesting for everybody here to listen to and some information that's worth of taking with you home and you can implement. It's not just a matter of wording, but something that you can implement. Uh, my colleagues are here also. The full department is here. I would like to thank him first, thank my employee for supporting me in coming to this level. They're all here, three of them at this table and the head section is there. This is the full department, by the way were only five. In addition to the secretary, you can imagine and appreciate the work that's been done for the last four years, or the f five years, exactly five years. This department was established five years ago as a regulatory, and we started from scratch, from zero. And uh, this is the full team here with you. Uh, what are the things that I'm going to go over? Uh, district cooling practice in Qatar, district cooling benefits to Qatar, district cooling suitable areas in Qatar, district cooling challenges in Qatar, district cooling regulations in Qatar, and at the end, an advice for countries with scarcity of water when they are going to implement district cooling, what to watch for. Of course, water is life. In the Gulf region, fresh water is precious. District cooling is consuming large quantity of water. That's the biggest challenge ever for people in this area. Conventional air conditioning electricity bill is high. District cooling can cut air conditioning electricity bills by half. These are some informations. What are the district cooling practices in Qatar? We have in Qatar two leading companies, Qatar Cool and Marafik Qatar, in addition to a number of private district cooling systems. What's the difference between both? Qatar Cool and Marafik, they're working on a commercial basis. At the private district cooling, they're using district cooling systems only 
for themselves, not com commercial, uh, no commercializing. Uh, here a picture of the plant, uh, pl plants of this cooling on Qatar, about 50 number of them scattered all over Qatar. Uh, we have operational district cooling projects, 23 numbers, with a total installed capacity of 6, uh, 665,000 ton refrigeration. Uh, we have under construction projects, total 22, uh, 42. And under design projects, 16. That's means we have done a survey all over the country to know the running projects, under construction projects, and projects under design for future, just to consider in our plan for future expansion, and to set up the regulation part carefully. Now, the district cooling capacity, the existing capacity now of district cooling, in 2016, Qatar district cooling capacity reached 655 kilo ton refrigeration of about 14% of the total cooling capacity. And the projection expected to reach by 2030 to 19% district cooling out of the total capacity of cooling in the country. What are the benefits to the country of district cooling? By 2030, we can save 10% of potable water capital demand and 30% of electrical power. Contributing to water resources sustainability by utilizing TSE and recycling district cooling blow down to STWP. Cutting the district cooling bill by utilizing TSE as alternative to potable water. Potential financial cumulative savings to state of Qatar reached are around 15 billion Qatar real by 2030. We can save water. Actually, we started saving water on 2015. We saved one cubic million water in 2015. And 2016, we saved three million cubic water. And by 2020, we are hoping that all projects in Qatar will convert to utilizing TSE as a replacement of fresh water. Uh, accumulative saving in money, as we said, 14 billion by 2030. What is the advice to the country with the scarcity of water? If they're going to apply district cooling, they should watch for something, that they, they will have to use TSE polishing plant. And TSE network should be available a place or a network of cooling plant discharge disposal. That's what we have faced in Qatar. We have issued the order not to utilize fresh water for district cooling. But what's the substitute? Substitute is the TSE. Now, is it available? If it is available, is the network of the TSE available to the project or not? Now, after utilizing the TSE, the discharge, where is it going to go? Needs to be discharged somewhere. That's the biggest challenge in Qatar. Now, this is current challenges in Qatar. Selecting end users' complaints in Qatar. People have moved out from district cooling building because of the high cost of cooling. Even when we have everything shut off, it still cools, and we end up paying for it. Even when we are not there, it still cost us 800 Qatar real a month. Residents in low occupancy buildings suffer most as fixed cost of running the plant is spread across fewer bill payers. The service of our open air large terrace is included in the contractual cooling area. Residents have seen price hikes off in their monthly bills. Utility bills for district cooling are very high. These are some of the wording that we received from end users. Now, district cooling challenges. 
District Cooling growth is hindered by several challenges that the District Cooling Regulatory Framework aims to address. Lack of consumer protection mechanism, scarcity of potable water in the region, issues in planning and project phasing, misalignment and benefit allocations. Now comes the regulations to help in solving those challenges. This is a picture that reflects the coordination between us as district cooling department and the national development projects to define the suitable district cooling served areas in the future. That was, this is an answer for one of the questions that was raised in the first session this morning. And we categorized it as grade A, B, C, D, E, in the whole country. Now, district cooling players categories, who are the stakeholders here? District cooling stakeholders. The district cooling providers, here, Qatar Cool, Marafal. Developers, like Qatar Foundation, Michel Pro Properties, Hamad Medical Corporation, Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy. Other major developers, like the airport, Hamad Airport. Government entities, Kahrama, Ashgal, Ministry of Municipality and Environment, Ministry of Public Health, Ministry of Economy and Commerce. Regulatory framework, dimensions and key questions. This is the one that I'm going to read in detail. I'm not gonna skip it like the others quick. Uh, the dimensions are eight dimensions. The mandating, should this cooling be mandated in certain areas and to what extent? Incentives, should specific incentives be provided to the securing providers in order to address the market distortions? What supply and discharge? Water supply and discharge. What water supply to use and how to manage the discharge? Billing and tariffs, how tariffs should be structured and set? What allocation of payments is needed to align with risks? Market competition, what rules and are needed to ensure competitive and open market for district cooling projects? Technical and service performance, what, at, what technical standards and guidelines are needed to ensure delivery efficiency and sustainability? Licensing, what type of licensing are required and what are the terms? Contractual frameworks, what type of contractual framework should bind different stakeholders in the market. And by the way, this has been done with the help of leading worldwide uh, consultants, consortium of consultants actually. We brought seven basic consultants in the world. They could not take the project. So they merged together, why? Because we have integrated project that covers administrative, legal, tariff, and law, all together. So we had three consultants, each one with its speciality. And we finished the project within nine months successfully. And alhamdulillah, I think as per the consultant saying, he said it's one of its, uh, one of its kind worldwide. And we are willing to share with anybody our experience. Now the organization design principles for effective regulations the District Cooling Regulators organization designed to meet a set of below key principles, benchmarked with international district cooling regulators. Ensure coverage of all district cooling regulatory activities. Enable efficient regulatory processes. Facilitate skills development and categorization. Maximize flexibility to changes in cooling market. Ensure ease of implementation. The proposed strategic objectives and district cooling regulatory actions. To reach the strategic objectives, the district cooling regulatory ta uh, takes regulatory actions and assesses them with several KPIs. Strategic objectives, environmental protection and health, customer protection, energy efficiency, human capital, new technologies and innovation with actions and KPIs, reaching to regulatory effectiveness. 
Now, what are the pillars of a price regulations? Proposed digital cooling pro price regulation consists of, five, of, of four key pillars. Key pillars of digital cooling price regulations, the tariff structure, the payment schemes, price control mechanism, and ownership structure. Digital cooling operations stakeholders. Digital cooling sector potentially involves stakeholders and entities that may exchange services and monetary transaction. We have to have some clear definition of all, so not to overlap between each other. So we decided to have a clear definition of those stakeholders, the district cooling providers, and the district cooling retailer, the developer, unit owner, occupant, or the tenant. Brief about district cooling department mission and achievements. Our, uh, this is the duties responsibilities of the department. The district cooling services department came into existence with the resolution from Council of Ministry by reference dated 2nd May 2012, but put into action October 2012. That means exactly five years from now. The duties and responsibilities is to suggest general policies for district cooling, set up rules and regulations for district cooling, and ensure that they are being complied with, set up district cooling standards and specifications and ensure that they are being complied with, decide on areas to be served by district cooling as per priorities and visibility, suggest tariff structure for customers, approve the cooling activities, develop integrated programs of whatever related to the cooling, coordinate with all concerned authorities with regards to the cooling. And we almost have completed all of this. But we are now following up the execution. Now, what are the achievements so far? On May 2012, the Securing Service Department, established as Corporate Regulatory Body of Qatar General Electricity and Water, May 2013, the Securing Department suggested prohibition of water, of potable water, for cooling purpose and to utilize treated sewage effluent as suitable alternative. Uh, that was granted. Qatar Council of Ministry approved the uh, directive of prohibition of potable water. May 2013, Kaharman notified over 53 district cooling operators on the prohibition directive and to utilize TSE for cooling. June 2013, established effective district cooling stakeholders coordination and conducted district cooling workshop all over the country. October 2015, the district cooling department developed the regulatory framework structure for district cooling services in Qatar by International Consultants Consortium May 2017, the district cooling department published the district cooling code as part of Kaharma published contractual regulations. In addition to that, we have suggested to GCC countries to, uh, on 10th of April to introduce a district cooling committee within GCC uh, committees in order to exchange the experience now, Kaharama is currently developing Qatar district cooling law, anticipated, anticipated to publish in the first version of Qatar district cooling law by 2018. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. This uh, was very impressive to see what uh, you are doing here in your home country. And uh, well, now we will change a little bit to Europe. And afterwards, uh, I think uh, we have time for some questions. Or do you have any question already now? Please. all the different uh, uh, entities to make sure that, you know, the, the business is basically is, is, is secured in the fact that if you mandate TSE, there's a supply of TSE, um, 
you know, the, the discharges with MME are, are coordinated and, and that sort of thing. Because uh, uh, I think there has to be a, a, a holistic approach to your regulations as related to all of the other uh, entities in, in Qatar. So in that respect, you know, how does that, how has that been coordinated and, uh, and, and specifically in, you know, in competition with landscaping needs, the TSC supply, you know, that's, that's one of the direct competitions is the, the, the landscape uh, need for TSC and the district cooling need for TSC, so. Uh, we have coordinating with all parties in Qatar, uh, even providers. We have taken their feedback of their experience with end users and the technical part and how do they wish to be as regulator in the future. We have taken some of the words of the end users and the major players or the stakeholders, Ashgal, Ministry of Environment also, they are with us on daily basis. And there is also the Permanent Water Resources Committee, which is chaired by our minister, members of three other ministers, and the president of Kahrama, president of Ashgal. What has happened after this uh, prohibition of using the fresh water, of course, the existing projects you cannot just force them without having the substitute. That's mean the Lord has gone to Ashgal to prepare their networks. So Ashgal have changed their master plan to meet the requirement of district cooling. And they're moving forward. They, we, are, we have succeeded with the uh, Qatar cool in the area uh, in uh, Daphna. Daphna. Okay, West Bay, West Bay area. They have converted to TSE, okay? And before they do their homework, actually, they have to visit also UAE to see that, in their experience, when it shifted to TSE, what was the precaution that should they, they should take and consider? So we work together with all of them. And we give some waivers, actually, to reach the goal. It's not just by force that we implemented. So as God is doing their job, we're doing our job to monitor the implementation every day. And Ashgal, they're changing their master plan. With regards to using TSE for irrigation, that's true. There's a team set up for that, followed up, and I led the team. Uh, the decision was taken by uh, Permanent Water Resources Committee to prioritize the supply to, of TSE to district cooling, mm -hmm. first. Secondly, for the irrigation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question? Two. Salah Mizar. Ustad Ibrahim, thank you for the presentation. It was good. Uh, great to know the progress. Uh, I have two uh, questions. Number one is on the KPIs. I think one critical factor we should is the definition of the thermal comfort in this region. It's defined by the health, but it's very important that we work on the definition of the thermal comfort zone that will allow us to work on the boundary because H355 for thermal comfort is not allowing any system to use temperature below 22, 23. The standard here in this region is 21. And we saw a number of villas and palaces where the owner is requiring 19. So we need, that's one of the KPI should be clearly defined. The second thing is the, uh, the, the, the aspect of benchmarking. If we are issuing law in 2018, I think it's important to uh, capture the lesson learned from other cities in the world, wherever, and define kind of initial benchmarking that we will target to go through. And that's all what I have. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Actually, uh, this is also done by the consultant. We have benchmarked with other countries as regulatory. I have mentioned it. Two more, and then we will continue. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. بخصوص ال district cooling code 2016 that uh, which authority is going to verify uh, and wh what's the level of tolerance? Now uh, you've set the code. Uh, there is a set of requirements. Uh, how is it going to be verified? Now uh, are we using the TSE or not? And are we getting the 
right amount or not? How are we mixing it? Because we have been to Qatar Cool, and still they are not uh, sure that, okay, uh, on the impact of having TSE 100%, which is gonna be a bit, uh, it's gonna take a, a time to verify. The, to implement the TSE usage of TSE in the district cooling, we have four plants that's, and five plants that's older than, before this uh, uh, rule has been implemented. Uh, the impact is gonna be the availability, as you mentioned, but the impact, the cost impact is gonna have to, uh, to modify the cooling, uh, this cooling plant is gonna be uh, a, a huge uh, impact. We did some study, and we knew that once you replace your equipment, you can get back your money within two years maximum, and the rest is benefit for you. The code is actually, the code, it's already uh, published, code of practice, and there is also, if there is any clarity that anybody needs, they come and to discuss with the, the, the requirements that they should apply. One of the requirements that they should apply ahead of time, not to replace, as any new, any new project should be ready to install the equipment that is suitable for TSE from the beginning. Plus, uh, future-wise, they should be ready to report to us online as a regulator on certain things that we require from them. No, the law, hopefully, by next year we will have the law. Okay, but already from coordination, like with Qatar Cool, we started coordination, they actually co up with, with us without even the law started. Now the coordination is there, available. And we are coordinating with Amarafaq also, with all the projects in Qatar, we started with them coordinating, we, we actually, we studied the market and we got all the database of district cooling and we approached every single entity for the last three years or four years. Yeah, developer should reach us, once you reach us, as soon as you apply for uh, bulk application or building permit, we get you from there. Immediately it's going to transfer to us. Okay, last question. For the moment. Hello, uh, Sayyid Ibrahim. I just have a couple of comments and then lead into a question. But um, actually, I'll just start with a question to begin with. But does Kahrama have a demand side strategy uh, that is very clear in the penetration of district cooling? Uh, you've plotted out very clearly as to places that are viable as far as district cooling is concerned. Somebody that is very familiar with the district cooling world here in the GCC, for instance, Dubai, has an agenda to have 30% uh, district cooling because of its capital and operating savings that will have on the long run, quite ex extensive. And so their regulation, to some extent, is streamlined with that agenda, okay? Now, establishing regulations and code can mean, yes, there is a saving on one side, but there's also an additional capital cost that is required that would have to be reflected in tariffs. And without the support, you have to have economic of scale, quite extensive economic of scale, and less of price, price distortions and within the market itself to really make the project viable in uh, GCC, specifically in Qatar. And if we are mandating uh, regulation and code, increasing the cost, which are reflected in the tariffs themselves, this would mean less penetration on district cooling. Okay, we're having, I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Qatar Cool, so <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult sometimes to negotiate on specific tariff rates with the owners or developers because they don't quite understand there's a misconception on cost. Mm. It's a huge, intense uh, initial capital cost that is required to invest in some of these facilities. And our payback period, they, they, they think, is only three years. That's not the case. Yeah. Okay? <coughs> uh, uh, because they, they look at the tariffs and most of the complaints that you've said, it's exactly right, you're spot on. So what is Kahrama doing to A, increase the penetration of district cooling because Maybe it's not good for the owner per se, 
and the way they perceive it, okay, but it's very good for the country as a whole from a macro view, uh, and B, what are they doing when they're implementing the regulations to ensure, to ensure that to some extent they, 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 they make it as a viable business for investors such as us to increase the, 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 their, their share of that, the, those specific districts? I hope I didn't muddy the water. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, actually, I like those questions, but we have already considered them with the consultant. We have a program that soon that you apply for a, executing a district cooling. That format is already, we, uh, the program itself calculates at the end what is the tariff that should be within a limit. We are having in mind everybody should be happy. Providers, developers, end users. That's considered all in the project of district cooling as a framework, regulatory framework. And we have a, a software that once you apply for district cooling for certain projects, we feed in the information and we'll see the result immediately at the end. Is it within the tariff? Within a limit? You have a limit to play, to play with, okay? Uh, that's with regard to the full scheme of tariffs, okay? That's considered. Bearing in mind that you are not losing as a provider of district cooling, okay? Uh, that's all considered in the, in the, in the, project, in, uh, in the software itself because it was done by the consultant or consultant or consultants. They know what's going on in the market. They have studied the market fully and they have met with you, met with Marafiq, in addition to their previous experience in the GCC. Okay, now, with regards to the government, we have raised to the government the benefits that the, the people will gain of the securing and the benefits that the government will gain, regardless of people now. Now, it's their decision to decide whether they're, going, whether they're going to intensify something or not. That is, we are waiting for the meeting, the last meeting with Prime Minister. But this is already uh, a comprehensive study done. We don't want, we want uh, the penetration of district cooling, but bearing in mind the most important part, the scarcity of water. Okay. In addition, the integrated water resources management in the country, which that's why we, we have moved to the TSE or seawater. So it's a project by project. The cost will be bared there, calculated, and to see the final result. You will know it at the start, actually, once you apply for the, the project itself, will give you that you are going to succeed or not. This is the tariff that we're going to accept within this range. And then you revisit your calculation before you start. So it's good for you and good for the government and good for the end user also. From the start, from the stage of applying for the district cooling project. Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you. We will continue our discussion afterwards, but uh, now I would like to Continue with the presentations as the second presenter. We have Monica Kusela. She's a senior manager at the Fortum Corporation. Monica, she holds a Master of Law title and has also completed uh, postgraduate studies in public relations and communication. She has over 12 years of experience from working as a regulatory affairs and communication professional in energy industry. Well, as I said, she's working for Fortune Corporation and she is also a member of the board of directors and vice chairman of energy policy committee at Eurohead and Power. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, a long introduction. <laughs> I will try to keep my presentation brief. Um, thank you very much for having me. I have never been to Qatar before, and it's also a big experience for me to see and to listen uh, for, for the presentations of today. Uh, your presentation reminded me actually a lot of discussion that we are holding at the moment in Europe about district heating. So from very warm Qatar, uh, welcome to Northern Europe. 
Uh, I, will go, I, will, I will drive it through the presentation, uh, which I built it upon a couple of information about our company, what do we do, and from where we have gained the experience on the regulation of, of district heating, actually, because district cooling is not regulated in Europe at all. But uh, I don't know how it works. Should I? Yes, now it works. What is Fortum? Mm, we are energy energy company, energy utility. Uh, we are doing a lot of different energy production and, and distribution of heat and also cooling. But we are also dealing with the um, so-called circular economy concepts where we are uh, recovering the energy but also the materials from a different fraction of waste. We are mainly present in the Nordic countries. It's, um, of course, Finland as a home market, Sweden, uh, Norway, um, and in Denmark from, from the recent times with the, with the facility of the of the waste treatment, but also in three Baltic countries. It's uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. We are largely present in Poland and in Russia. In India, we are also having the entity that is actually delivering the solar energy uh, for, the, uh, for, for the grid. Uh, 9,000 people around the globe. Um, quite interesting also activities around cleaning the contaminated waters by our expert solutions. Um, we are cleaning the waters in Fukushima, for example. It's something that is um, not that widely known, but we do that as well. But as you can see, that uh, our main generation in electricity market is, uh, cons um, is basically cons uh, cons constructed on hydro and nuclear power. Um, as I, I mentioned already, what do we do? But um, what is, I guess, interesting for you is that we are trying to deliver it uh, also comfort. The, the delivery of comfort has been mentioned here a couple of times. We are delivering the solutions for the customers, not only the heat as it used to be, uh, traditionally that we were having a contract for certain capacity, we were delivering that capacity to the customer, but now we are delivering the comfort. We are building the solutions, also the digital solutions, that our customers can um, actually actively let us know what do they need. Uh, we also build so-called virtual power plants. You know that it's now a big trend to have a virtual power plants and try to a uh, little bit play uh, about the re demand response. We built a big um, batteries in the Nordic countries and we are also utilizing uh, a sewage water for the cooling networks in the Nordics and also salty water from the sea. But of course the salty water from this Baltic Sea and the sea over here is completely different animal and we cannot anyhow compare it. It's almost a, almost a sweet water in the, in the local conditions. Uh, I think that somehow, yes, here it is. Uh, this is, uh, I wanted to show it to you from two reasons. One reason is that, that you can see how many different plants we are operating and how many different systems we are operating. But from the other angle, I would like to underline here that we are also dealing with a number of different regulations. So each and every of those countries that you can see enlightened in green has been able to develop a different regulation and legal basis to regulate price and control district heating. And it's not that easy to adjust to the local conditions, I, I must say. In some of those countries, we are having so-called light up type of regulation, where we are only having competition-based um, uh, regulation or legislation uh, that is regulating also district heating the same way how is it regulating the other services in the country. While in the other countries, usually post-Soviet countries, Poland and two Baltic states, Latvia and Lithuania, we are see, seeing very heavy touch regulation, where they are controlling the prices, controlling the access of, to the network by the producers, but also controlling contractual relations between the district heating company and the customers themselves. So basically, we are not managing the companies fully there. It's a district heating um, authority that is doing this on our behalf. And I must say, that's not the best solution. And we have been seeing that quite a lot, that um, those countries which have allowed for the commercial-based operations in district heating has been much more successful in increasing the penetration and getting much more developed solutions to deliver the heat for the customers. That's from our experience. And we've been, we've been there for a couple of decades. So we've seen quite, quite, quite a lot of different developments. And having said that, uh, we have been thinking how the district heating and cooling networks, what is the basis of the functioning? And, and in Europe, at least, where we are operating, we see that the only model that makes sense for the longer run is so-called uh, single system operator model. We have been also cooperating with a number of different consultants who have been trying to make us a set of rules that would be applicable for the, for the district heating as such 
but we also have seen that there is a lot of flexibility needed because the district heating system, and I think also the district cooling systems, they are different and they vary location by location from the geographical point of view, from the temperature point of view. You know, in Europe we are having quite a big differences in the, in the heating degree days between Finland and, for instance, southern Poland. So the district heating system also operates in a different way. Um, we still believe in a base of capacity for heating, at least, as a CHP plants, but we know that it's not enough. It's not enough anymore to have only district heating and, um, district heating and, and electricity. That's why we are also building the cooling, ne cooling networks, and that's why we're also trying to build additional installations, for example, the pyrolysis produced uh, bio-oil in one of our uh, power plants in Finland, which oil is used to replace the heavy oil in a different plants. We also, what we do also, and what you can see on that picture, is that we try to utilize a lot of waste heat that is available around our networks. So we are trying to get a heat from the industrial processes, but we also try to get heat from the big, big data centers. They are, they are really significant to produce the heating and they are doing that on a constant basis. So the load is there. It's the matter how do we recover that and how do we use it. And of course the question arises, how do we price it? But that we also solved, at least in Stockholm and in Espo, in Finland and in Sweden, we solved that, that we actually are um, um, setting a market uh, price that is um, suitable for both parties, for us to offtake the heat and for the suppliers to, who wants to get rid of heat simply. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we are also building the heating and electricity storages. That's something which is now additional to the district heating network that can accumulate the energy and, de and deliver the demand response actually to the customers. And as mentioned, we are also developing the district cooling networks. It's not so obvious in Europe, but we can see that now the thermal comfort, it includes heating and cooling. The climate is changing and customers simply requires more than, than earlier. This is the slide that I wanted to show that how the district heating and cooling is actually in that big company fulfilling also the strategic um, agenda. And here, I think very, more, very important elements are listed already on a slide, but I also already mentioned them describing the previous slide. But what I would like you to remember is that we have to change in Europe at least. Um, the the st 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 old model of functioning of district heating uh, companies is changing. We have to change to keep up before, because we are functioning in the very heavy competition. The competition of the alternatives which are coming and trying to get for the customers more than we have been able to offer so far. And coming to the next slide, I would like to show you also that we, we, what we believe in Fortum is that district heating and cooling can be a solution to battle climate change. And um, why? Because um, non recognized so far the role of heating in Europe is also changing. Everybody was concentrating on the electricity supply and saying that, okay, if we have a well-functioning emission trading systems and if we put emission limits, we can combat, combat the climate change. But it's not full, full story. There is a lot of heating produced domestically without any limitations on the emissions. And that is the biggest problem in Europe at the moment. How to capture that, that potential and, and switch it to something that makes sense in combating the climate change in Europe. But our life ain't easy. Uh, this is per purpose. This is, the, uh, this is the legislation of EU that is at the moment changing. And as you can see, it's super complicated. And the amounts of different um, legal acts only on the EU level is now uh, really, really um, overwhelming us with the, <laughs> with the EU interest. On top of that, we of course have national policies and regulations, but this is what is happening now in EU. All of those policies, oh, most of those policies are overlapping in addition and creating certain con controversies on between, between them and also not letting us that easily interpret what we should do in the future to deliver the targets of European Union. That's the second part of the same slide, just showing that there are some ways out, but it will take sometimes um, for us to, to find out how it actually should work. So, uh, coming to the finals, uh, I would like to, we have been discussing that the whole day, what is needed to develop the district heating and cooling networks, and I think we are exactly on the same page, that there has to be a very constructive dialogue, and this dialogue has to be forward looking. So we have to look not tomorrow or week after, but we have to look for the lifetime of those assets 
15, 20 years from now, what is going to happen and how can we actually um, ensure that, that we are doing the right things together with authorities, together with the legislators, together with our customers, that we can, can be competitive also in, in a little bit longer time frame. Uh, when we look at Europe again, so the energy policies should cover the whole heat market. That was what I also tried to say, not only the district heating, but the whole heat market, which is also including the other forms of heating, which are not struggled with a lot of policies as we are at the moment. So it does not create an equal battlefield for those uh, technologies to compete. Also what we have seen that the transparency is super important. Uh, when there is a new policies uh, coming to the picture, transparency of the process, and also potential possibilities to influence, to discuss those policies, as well as I think that market participants should require also some sort of analysis of the consequences why once the policies have been implemented or, and should, should work. And what we have seen also in district heating and cooling regulation, when it is in place, it should always be cost covering and incentive based to trigger the new investments. And just in a couple of final words, um, we know that energy efficiency, at least in Europe, will drop the consumption further. And we also know that the profiles of our customers, energy profiles of the customers are changing. They are much more demanding and much more, they're having much wider knowledge on what they can have if they don't choose district heating. And that is always like a stick with two ends. That on one hand, it triggers us to do things to change, but on the other hand, it's also shrinking our market uh, penetration. We also see that the cooling becomes the big solution in Europe and it, and it will grow. And um, because of that, we also need to develop the optimization of the, of the production, which is even more important than before. Thank you very much for your attention. for your presentation, Monica. Any questions right now, please? <laughs> Actually, I have several, but uh, I'll, I'll begin with the, uh, the, the elephant in the room, and that's uh, with Donald Trump uh, uh, or America pulling out of the Paris Accord. How has that affected uh, basically all the initiatives that are around the subject? But that's pr it's pretty much a, a big thing, given all the funding that was probably there, and now it's uh, dried up to some extent. <clears throat> the other one, you talked about uh, alternatives uh, that are competing. Um, how does uh, district cooling or district heating providers uh, look at the viability of a project if zoning is not there. Um, um, it's huge initial capital costs that are required and you want guaranteed so at least to allocate the risks appropriately when it comes to demand itself. Um, and if you're competing with alternatives there's no use for a district uh, uh, energy provider to actually start up because it's just the more possible. I'm not going to build all that infrastructure and then have to compete with something on the on the on the back end. Um, I, I'll leave it there because I've got another two, but uh, I don't want to branch off. <laughs> um, well, referring to the first one, the U.S. policies um, and the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. So, of course, we are not happy about it. So, uh, the Europeans are not happy about it. But um, what can we do? I mean, we can only drag the agenda further on our behalf. And we will see COP starting next week. So we will see what will happen after that. Um, in terms of uh, f financial um, possibilities, I don't know if that have affected that much, uh, the, the development, because I think that the, the local developments are financed with the, with the local, local funds. So, so I, I haven't heard anything like significant at least, but I'm not also the right person um, to talk about it, I'm afraid. In terms of um, allocation of risk and, and uh, building a new district heating or cooling system, so in Europe this is very difficult to develop any new district heating in general because of the density. And the feasible district heating and cooling system should be built in the agglomerations, which are old, as you know, and, and very dense. So it's super, super difficult to build anything new, to put a large infrastructure under the ground when 
that's basically impossible. What happens then is that because of the urbanization, it's, it's kind of very much and fast emerging, so we are having a lot of new areas around the cities with a large um, populated uh, multifamily houses. And there we are delivering, there we are building uh, um, additional or new networks or connecting to the existing networks, that's what we do. And in terms of uh, competition, um, well, the, as in every other market, you're always competing, you always have to bury the risk. In this situation with the large infrastructure which is so cost, um, so, so heavy with the costs because you have to possess quite a significant funds in the beginning to start developments of anything. So, of course, it would be nice to have some guarantees that it won't be disconnected immediately, but on the other hand, we don't want to have regulation as district heating. We simply don't want to have it. It's super complicated. And uh, when I'm observing, like for instance, Poland is a very good example when there is a very heavy touch regulation. And it, at the moment, I think that the, if I remember correctly, 50 or 60% of the distribution capacity and production capacity is already outdated and should be replaced. And there is not many companies that are willing to take that investment up because the regulation is so so difficult, it's not covering the costs or the costs are actually shifted two years from the initial investment, uh, just the beginning of the, of the recap, the cost, I'm not saying about total recap because of the tariff structure. We can discuss that actually, I, I can explain how the tariff structure is constructed. It's very complicated and it's not favoring any new investments, unfortunately. Jeff, please. Uh, generally, the, there is uh, several dimensions of the different policies in Europe. So the first dimension is the European policies, and the second dimension is the national policies, and then there is a third dimension which is uh, local policies. And basically, district heating operators and producers they are discussing in all of three forums. As Werner uh, kindly mentioned, I'm part of the um, of vice chair of the energy policy group that is working in Euro Heat and Power. So we are discussing with. European Commission, with European parliamentarians, we are discussing also um, uh, with the peer companies and with the other associations to try to develop the solution that would suit us all. On a country level, it depends on the country, so you might have only the Ministry of Energy responsible for district heating, and you might also have the Minis Ministry of Environment heavily involved in those policies, and on top of that you might also have a regulatory office, which is basically the steering um, the policies also to certain certain extent. And on a national level, so here we have representative of city of Rotterdam. We are not in Rotterdam, but I would glad to be there <laughs> because of Astrid. Uh, we are also discussing on the, on the, on the level of the cities um, uh, about the planning, about the supplies, about the, the urban planning, of course, uh, about the, the, the possibilities to even uh, on the road constructions, because we, if we are building a new plant, we need to be sure that we can uh, deliver, for instance, biomass somehow to that plant to, to, to fuel it. Just um, my name is Astrid Mats. I'm from the city of Rotterdam, and and on on the competing with the alternatives, what we see in the Netherlands is that for a total cost of ownership, very often uh, district heating is a better solution. However, um, developers look at the initial costs and they can b sell the, the apartments and so then suddenly alternatives still using fossil fuel are relatively cheap in building while at the total cost of ownership it's not um, um, and, and you see that that it's still not uh, well enough in the minds of people to look at the total cost of ownership so they buy a house which looks like a good solution which heats up fine with fossil fuels and then uh, but in the time, we, we need to change it. So, so there's a difference between, between the total cost of ownership and the initial cost, and that's where competition takes place. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I think we are running the panel already. Sorry. But uh, actually, it depends. Again, um, there is, uh, there is a, the, uh, the price itself ain't subsidized, but there is a different forms of subsidies available uh, for the production, for instance, of the, um, of the energy in different countries. But that's also a larger topic to discuss because there is like um, investment uh, subsidies available, operational aid available, and it varies country by country in EU. So there was another question. Um. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ديس صلاح نزار فروم تكنيكال اسبيكت فيو ييرز باك نمبر اوف اكسبيرت وي ميت ان زوك ان سويسرلاند توكين اباوت وات ار ذا ريل اوبورتونيتيز فروم ديفلوبر ستاند بوينت ان ديفلوبين ديستريكت كولين ان هيتينغ ان يوروب and from the technicality and cost effectiveness the cost of the reticulation was the main main hurdle in developing because it's the cost of the piping but more in the civil work in old cities of course and yeah. uh, that's really it hurting and uh, one of the conclusion in that um, workshop is to push some of the technology uh, uh, companies in Europe to work on micro tunneling, finding another way. And one of the other as aspect is to let the district heat heating system work here on the summer and having steam driven chillers running, producing the cooling. So because the, you cannot basically sometimes technically let the pipe for heating be used for cooling. So it's rather to keep the heating available even in the summer and run the same thing in New York City run in steam, that could be a solution, particular cities like Paris or uh, I was mentioning this morning, Budapest in downtown, you have landmark building, you cannot change them, you cannot put uh, an outdoor cooling, and people 70, 80 years old, they are dying to have a cooling. So uh, I think the aspect, there is tarification, there is a business case, but the key element, we have to find a technical solution. For the and without that, we're going to be always stagnant in that uh, area. That's all I have. Thank you. Do you have an idea? <laughs> I have some of ideas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we should talk about it. But before uh, continuing with questions, I'd like to present to you also two other people here uh, on our board. It's uh, Astrid Madsen, she's Director of Research and Development of uh, the City of Rotterdam, and uh, she is uh, Sustainability Program Advisor of the City of Rotterdam and Board of board Member of uh, Stichting Warme Netwerk. <laughs> is that? <it>? Yeah? <laughs> and uh, regarding to her academic performance, uh, Mrs. Madsen holds a degree on civil technology and management from the University of Twente. And uh, we also have someone from Spain here. Uh, it's uh, Javier Martin uh, Sanz, research responsible for Veolia Servicios Lecam. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer and uh, he is uh, working for Veolia since uh, how many years? Okay, <laughs> so uh, we will have uh, the next 20 minutes time to answer your questions and uh, I'd like to start with some questions uh, regarding first of all the city of Rotterdam. Astrid, uh, working at the city level you have first-hand experience of the challenges and opportunities associated with district heating and cooling at a very local level. Well, maybe you can tell us about your experience trying to make district energy work for the people in Rotterdam. Yes, I can. Um, maybe I should first start at uh, a little bit of information about the city of Rotterdam. In, in the Netherlands, uh, most of our houses are heated with natural gas. For the city of Rotterdam, it's still 80%. Well, with our climate goals, of course, um, but also with the fact that we produce our own natural gas, but the production is really low now. Uh, we need to replace the way we heat up houses and we need to s find a different way of heating it. Um, so, from a city's perspective, we look at a way of making uh, heating reliable, clean, affordable and safe for everybody. Uh, so, in that, we try to look at alternatives. Um, important is to know that we need to finish that by 2050 and by that time, probably 90% of the buildings that are right now there are still there. 
So we're not talking about new buildings, which is relatively easy, uh, but we're talking about existing buildings being heated now by natural gas and need to reform to something else. Um, and in our search to look at alternatives, we both look at uh, ways of electrical heating, but that needs a lot of insulating. Uh, and we look at uh, district heating. And um, we find, especially for city of Rotterdam, where there's a lot of uh, houses built close together, so there's a high density of heat demand, we uh, see that district heating is uh, one of the best solutions. If you look at both the, the cost of buildings level and district level, um, district heating is a better alternative than the electrical heating uh, uh, alternatives. Not in every area, but in most areas. So in that transformation, what we see is that uh, there is a bit of, in, in the Netherlands, the gas and electricity grid is socialized, so everybody pays the same, and district heating is commercial. Um, so it has another feel to it, and people, there is a strong con consumer law already in place, and what we see is actually the, the notes I saw from district cooling, as in uh, what you just said, uh, uh, I pay too much, we also hear it even though there's consumer protection. So having a long consumer protection does not exactly mean that people are um, confident with fair pricing uh, because there you have to you have an image as a commercial company. So fair pricing is not always uh, felt even though there's a law in place. Uh, so th that's that's at least uh, what we uh, notice. In in that transition towards district heating, we try to find ways of organizing the the, the transition um, and to make it um, make propositions that are. Um, uh, good for the end user, um, and with that is is a bit of a, a, a problem because I'm I'm not for a co commercial company. I'm I'm working for the city, and I want to do what's best for all citizens of Rotterdam and not just a few. And that's exactly uh, actually the, w what you just mentioned is is that you want to have uh, plots where you work optimum, and not individual best optimums. Um, so, so there's sometimes quite a discussion between um, heating companies uh, and, and the city. Uh, because at a heat, as a city, I just say, well, I, I'd rather have district heating here and, and alternatives somewhere else. At the same time, when I say that, I don't want to pay the full price, of course, because I'm making the market. So why, why should the consumer end up uh, paying for it? So, so we are now in, in the Netherlands actually in, in sort of a... Um, uh, in between, like how are we going to uh, organize the transition away from natural gas, using all the knowledge we have, using the companies, and at the same time making it affordable. And that's that's the challenge we are heading now. And I think I think the 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 comparison with uh, district cooling is is amazingly equal. I could almost copy cooling and and paste heat in there, and it was comparable. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Changing from Rotterdam to Spain. Spain is perhaps not the first country I would associate with district energy, but actually there are some exciting developments taking place there. Is there, my question, a bright future for heating and cooling networks in Spain? What do you think? Good question. Javier. <coughs> uh, I want to add another point of view, uh, trying to obtain new opportunities uh, in this uh, discussion. The problem in Spain is that uh, we are in the middle with the northern countries uh, where there is a lot of uh, heating system and we are not in the Middle East, uh, so we don't have the, the, the same demand at, at, the cooling, uh, uh, at, the, at the district cooling. In that case, the main issue that we have is that uh, we have a lot of uh, building, residential buildings from the 80s with a lot of loses. And that point is a good opportunity for us to develop new district heatings and to retrofit the current district heatings. It's true that uh, in the rest of uh, European countries, it's very difficult to develop a new district heating due to the lot of reason that uh, Monica said. But in the specific case of Spain, it's easier because uh, we have an opportunity with the national regulation about the administrative accounting. Because the municipalities and the government has um, uh, 
specific accounting about the investment, so it's not possible to develop all the investment by the municipality, and it's a very good solution, a PPP model, a collaborative model with the, with the companies trying to develop this kind of uh, district heating or, in that case, district cooling. This is a good opportunity for us right now. And the other point of view that I want to introduce is the prices. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, very low prices of the energy, mainly with the, the gas, the biomass, the electricity, and so on. So we are focused on the energy efficiency, it's true, but all the investment doesn't have the um, enough uh, profitable or enough viability due to these prices. If the price is, uh, I don't know uh, what is the percentage, but uh, go up uh, 10 or 15 percent, <coughs> 15%, could be very interesting to develop this kind of solution. And the third point uh, that I want to introduce is the, the cooling. Probably the administrative uh, buildings, the shopping malls, the industry, this kind of buildings needs uh, district coolings, but the most of the residential areas doesn't have in Spain, uh, and probably in the most of Europe, a uh, cooling system in its uh, dwellings, in its homes. So at the end, it's very difficult to uh, make a specific investment to deploy or to develop uh, some new uh, district cooling due to the, the prices. In Spain, we have a success um, uh, example, that is the um, uh, Marina District Hooling in Barcelona, uh, developed by, by Veolia. But uh, that case is, uh, is very specific, because we have in the same area, industry, administrative area, malls, and residential area. So the, the first um, engine is the industry, and then the rest of the buildings are connected to to this uh, district cooling and district heating. Yeah. Uh, I want to, to add, to summarize, there are opportunities due to the administrative situation about the, the, the accounting. There are opportunities with the prices and, and also there are opportunities with the retrofitting of the, the current installations. Thanks. Okay. Well, <clears throat> actually, uh, in Europe, we are talking about the winter package and Monica just told us about uh, lots of pages. Actually, we are talking about 4,500 pages of regulatory work, so uh, it's a lot to do in the future, I think. Now, um, do you have any questions to the ladies and gentlemen here on the stage? Just a couple. Um, for uh, Monica, I guess you, uh, <coughs> you've you shown us the uh, spreadsheet or the, the, the path to regulation that you see at, at this point. Do you see it as prohibitive to district heating in terms of implementation, or is it going to be a lot harder to implement uh, a district heating process with these regulations or impossible, maybe? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question, um, <laughs> and that also refers to the to the point that I made during my presentation that actually, when uh, regulatory bodies are developing new policies, they should make a stress test. What does it mean when they implement them? Um, there is this kind of uh, assessments done, but um, well, at the moment we can see for district heating in this big package there is like a f three major legislations that might either jeopardize or trigger the district heating. The biggest of them is actually Renewables Directive, which is introducing some sort of, of mandatory, super-regulated um, th third-party access to district heating networks, and not only to district heating ne networks, but also to the uh, customer interface. And that doesn't work well. There is one country um, in, in the Europe which is having that already in, in place. It's Poland. It does not uh, work very well and never led to any positive um, developments actually, but led to overcapacity and a lot of stranded costs. So um, as said, we are still in the process. We, are we have just, um, I think, received um, uh, the third version of the, uh, of the uh, text by the Estonian presidency of the European Union, but the process will still take several months before we know what is going to be voted as a final proposal. That is one aspect, so it's the third party access. Another thing is the accommodation of the waste heat for the national targets 
of improving the renewability of the district heating networks and the proper definitions. That's also something which is very important. As you can see, we are supplying district heating networks from renewables, but also from the waste heat. And this uh, very complicated picture which I've shown hasn't included the so-called um, waste package, which is in parallel proceeded by the Commission and Parliament. So when you have district heating company uh, and also producer of the heat from different sources, you are exposed to a number I think, I don't exaggerate if I say tens of different regulations in EU only. And then on your national level, you have additional ones. So it's a multi-dimensional hybrid, a net <laughs> of a different regulations that you have to comply with. And it doesn't lead to anything else than to increase of costs, to be honest. So on that note, <coughs> um, since on a national level, you are saving energy with district heating, is there any talk of any subsidies to the business that would actually be beneficial and, and make it more viable uh, rather than, you know, making it kind of impossible? Uh, to, the, to the efficiency of the district heating network. So basically, uh, there is a regulation called Energy Efficiency Directive, which is providing the definition as on certain prerequisites of the functioning of district heating systems as efficient district heating systems, but unfortunately European Union is never making any firm regulation, I haven't seen one. Uh, they are very much up to interpretation and adjustment on the local levels, so then you actually compare peers to apples. You are having one efficiency model in one country and the other efficiency model in the other countries, and you should be somewhere in the middle to find, the, the, find a way if you are like international company like ASO or Veolia, so we are having a completely different approach in different member states of European Union and different incentives. Okay. One question for Austria. I want to add <laughs> something about okay. the money cancer. Uh, it's totally true that uh, depending on the country, the level of the regulation is, is different, but depending on the level of development of the district heating in, in each country, uh, I mean. Uh, in, in Spain, probably the government make different incentives or many subsidies to develop uh, different district heating. In Poland, for example, in the city of Lodz, where Veolia has a very huge uh, district heating, we are retrofitting the district heating because they have a district heating uh, for more than 50 years old. Or more, uh, so at the end, each uh, regulatory depends on the country. So Astrid, if they switch over to district energy from natural gas, what energy source would they use to produce the heat? Well, Rotterdam is the second largest harbor next to it, or in it, <laughs> and we waste about 150 petasjoule of heat per year, which is about 10% of the annual gas use. So our, uh, our current district heating source is waste incinerator, and we are trying to connect the industry, and we yeah, well, uh, uh, make sure that the w w waste is not uh, wasted anymore. So that's one, and we are making a source strategy um, in which we see and look at the, the industry because we also expect the industry to change, uh, which is still a fossil-based industry in the harbor, uh, and it probably will change to either bio-based industry or circular industry, uh, which also will have needs for, for heating and, and will produce waste heat. So, so we're trying to have the recoverable heat from the harbor. Uh, and, and finally, the, the region, Rotterdam the Hague, is very suitable for geothermal heat. So that's another source. So what we are doing, and I will talk a bit more about that tomorrow, is build a big regional energy system that sort of connects the, the heat sources and the heat demand areas to each other. Next question. <coughs> yes, coming back, you know, to uh, to our story with Mr. Uh, with Engineer Ibrahim in regard to this previous question, which has been asked, you know, during the first session, actually. I mean, I know it's going to be a very challenging job, you know, to coordinate with Ashral, you know, actually, and especially with the limitations of the TSE uh, with their network, actually. How far, you know, you are actually, do, do you have some sort of plans, you know, for the coming years and how far you are going to coordinate with them within the coming five years, you know, actually? And the other part is that what is the percentage of coverage now that you cover in regard to the, uh, to the district cooling 
At the same time, what do you have for the plans for the plans, you know, for the future also? Thank you. Actually, we are chasing every single project. We've got, we have transferred the TSE network from Ashgal to our GIS. Mm -hmm. And we have marked the distance between every project and the existing network. We also chase, we agreed with Ashgal to set a milestone to every single project. We have also, I did not go through the detail, on the map, it shows every single project, how far is it from the, from the TSE network, the existing one, and each project, when is it gonna reach with the network, with Ashgal? So they have a plan that they have fixed actually with us, and the projects that are unseen yet, they are telling us, please wait, this will be after 2022, because we are busy with the other projects. So every project, we know the milestones for it to reach the TSE, when? The biggest challenge is the quantity and the quality of the TSE, and they are also, also working with it. We have taken uh, Catercool as a model. They are the one who started as first to convert to the utilization of TSE from fresh water. Okay. We get a report from uh, Catercool every month with any incident that has a disturbance in the supply of TSE. We keep the fresh water as a backup. We did not disconnect the fresh water, no. It stays there and it's gonna stay there as a backup just in case the fluctuation or the supply does not come to them from the TSE so their work does not stop. And this is reported immediately because the consumption, and we have added also meter in there so the consumption should be calculated against the utilization of TSE and the fresh water. Uh, I don't remember the, how much the percentage, do you remember, Sergeant, the coverage of the TSE network? No, it, it's scattered because what happened is we have two providers, which is Marafiq and Ashgal, uh, and uh, Ketakul, okay? Ketakul have got the Pearl project and the West Bay, currently, okay? Now, uh, they have got the supply from seawater and in the Pearl. But in the West Bay, they've got the supply from Kahrama as a fresh water and replaced by the TSE. Other project, which is the Qatar Foundation, they're in the progress actually to convert to, to the to TSE. Some hotels are having a supply of TSE earlier, long time ago. There was another question. <clears throat> My question is for, is for uh, Astrid. Um, just wondering how how many years now the uh, district heating has been applied in the city of, of Rotterdam? Is it? Uh, this is my first question. You can answer it. Uh, well, we have uh, the, the the city center has a district heating cent, uh, network, and that was built just after the Second World War. Um, because we had to rebuild our city because during the Second World War it yeah. was bombed. So the whole the city center was rebuilt and then we put a uh, district heating network there. Okay. So you do have end users basically like uh, 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 homes and uh, people who use and and you've seen the uh, the complaints that uh, Mr. Ibrahim has shown in the... Okay. Th then uh, I'm wondering how um, uh, how much is the awareness has been made to these end users in, uh, in Rotterdam? Do, do, do these users know that they are using district heating? Or, uh, and do they know the benefits of them using district heating rather than uh, uh, normal uh, ways of, of heating? Yeah, yeah good, good question. Um, I think those who are happy with the product don't realize they have it. <laughs> 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 and and the ones that are complaining do realize they have it. So that's that's the thing. Uh, I think if you if you see there's a few uh, groups of people who are, are are not happy with district heating and they are very loud on on the internet and so on. So there's there's actually a rather small group that has a lot of attention, and I think there's a big group of people that are just happy with it and and maybe even not aware of the fact that they heat their house with 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 uh, district heating. Um, so that is a problem, and, and the awareness, definitely, that, that needs to improve a lot. Um, 
It is also, I think, the responsibility a bit of the heating company because the system was built uh, uh, just in, in the 50s. And, and I think at that time there was sort of, okay, well, we've got our consumers, they're connected, they can't do anything else, so I'm done. So the amount of consumer satisfaction and, and, and helping out, uh, well, it could have been a little bit better. So, so a part of the, the problems they, they have now in, in image of district heating are also caused by the companies themselves. Um, but the awareness definitely needs to improve because people are not aware that, that district heating is much more uh, efficient even that in the, and then even a CHP district heating is more efficient than individual gas boilers and people are not aware of that. Oh. Right, thank you. <coughs> I, I want to ask some, something about it. Uh, probably the people that are connected uh, in that district heating or district heating that are building the uh, 60s, 70s or so, something like this, they understand that this is the solution. There is not other option. So uh, the problem or the awareness is the new generation about the introduction of the uh, THC solution to energy meters, uh, uh, APP in the mobile phones or something like this to control the consumption. But they understand the district heating is the solution. They don't understand an individual boiler for this house. They understand that this is the solution, the district heating solution. Uh, well, one more question and then... Uh, <laughs> um, um, I, I was just wondering, this goes to Astrid, um, your, your preference is not commercial, but then my, my, my question to you is, there comes, a, there's a, there comes a time where one needs to question as far as security supply of natural gas and how much that costs. And so that needs to be imposed on another alternative that comes at a cost, okay? For Qatar, it's, it's uh, quite of a different dilemma all, all by itself. Uh, we use natural gas for our electricity. Mm -hmm. And that natural gas is what we use to liquefy and sell, mm -hmm. uh, and that makes up a good portion of our GDP. And the government needs to understand that if we use less of our natural gas, we've got more of it to export. Yeah. Okay. Now, Ibrahim will argue that and say, well, how about water? Um, and, and that's, a, that's a right argument to make. But h how did Rotterdam, how is Rotterdam going to deal with this in the future? Because the security supply of natural gas has a cost to it. And uh, there is going to be a cost burden somewhere in the equation that somebody would have to pay, either A, the government, or the end consumer. Um, and how are you dealing with that dilemma? If I only knew, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, for, first let me just say, I'm, I'm not definitely against commercial uh, um, uh, district heating networks. The thing is that there's not a level playing field at this moment, and there's a risk that the, the and, and that's the whole transition, it's, it's a cost division uh, dilemma. So who is going to pay for what? Uh, both in the, the infrastructure, um, uh, and, and the only thing I say is that current rules and regulations in the Netherlands cause uh, an unequal division of costs towards the end user. Because district heating owners need to pay for their own district heating, and as well they pay for other areas where the uh, electricity net needs to be reinforced for all electric heating, they also pay for that. So they sort of pay double, and that doesn't make sense. So, so we need to rethink uh, the, 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 the cost of putting down the grid in the ground of all energy infrastructure, so that, that, that's one. Um, the, the way we as a city look at things is that we make the city and the owners of buildings responsible for the transitions in terms of insulating the house, connecting to something else than natural gas, being either district heating or electricity, and, uh, well, have solar panels or you will use as much local, uh, uh, produce and use as much local energy as possible. With that, we don't make the people in the city responsible for balancing the system. And we say, actually, that is a regional thing. So the cities in the regional, together with the province, together with the national government, together with the companies, with the harbor area, they need to make sure that the energy system 
energy companies is balanced. And of course, that's costs. Uh, uh, and, and well, personally, I think in the end, all the costs end up with the end user because if the government plays, pays, it's taxes from the same people. So, so whether you, it, it feels different, but in the end, it's the end use. So what we need to do is make a system that is as uh, efficient, cost efficient, and energy efficient as possible. Uh, and and it is it is I mean it is struggle. Uh, we don't have all the clear answers yet. So, uh, well, actually, uh, our time is already. Okay. Of course. Actually, the heat company Rotterdam is looking into uh, uh, projects uh, to, to use summer cooling with the heat they have, access heat, so, yeah. So, <coughs> my last question to all four of you. And a short answer, please. What changes in district energy do you anticipate in the coming years? And everyone, just one sentence as a result. What changes in district energy, <coughs> or in also district cooling, do you anticipate in the coming years? The next uh, generation of district heating and cooling uh, should be the multi-source and the low temperature. It's the way that all of the suppliers, uh, energy companies, uh, probably we are working on, uh, trying to uh, take a lot of uh, sources, trying to choose what is the best one in, in each moment, and trying to uh, storage, trying to use uh, low temperature, seasonal storage, mix. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, you just said the word I was going to say, storage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think, uh, I think using uh, uh, um, district in energy should be an integral part of the whole energy system. Um, so to, to get towards more sources with lower emissions, you need more uh, uh, buffering of your energy. So, and district heating should be an integral part of the energy system. Thank you. Um, in Monica. addition to what they just said, so I think that uh, uh, demand response, digitalization of the district heating uh, and cooling, um, and as well as more utilization of, of existing capacities in heat. Thank you. I just agree with you totally, but with different wordings. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to focus more into conservation, okay, rather than bringing more uh, s sources of supply. We should focus more into conservation, and the the homework of designers not to over design things. Well, thank you, and last round of applause. Thank you for <laughs> this discussion. So, 